This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. It is so good to see the sunshine, isn't it? And to uh, look around and see all the beauty of God's creation and um, just uh, soak in um, this time of year. And we welcome you to worship during this uh, hour here at First Baptist and um, look forward to uh, singing together, hearing God's word, and most of all, experiencing God's uh, presence and encountering him during this time. Um, you saw me walking around with this little guy here. Um, we've had Noah a good bit this weekend uh, because Allie had to go back to Iowa City with very, lo very low, almost zero white blood cells. And so she had some infection and uh, they've got that under control and hopefully she'll come home tomorrow. And so thank you for your prayers for her and Ben and Noah, uh, the whole family, and um, appreciate that very much. We, um, we have um, our prayer request, which I want to encourage you to always uh, refer to. And um, so take a look at that. Also... ABWM meeting is tomorrow, and so just a reminder that that uh, is at 9.30, as usual, in the GA room. And um, also that um, at the end of the service today, we're going to have a, a special moment when Richard Houston comes forward to join the church. And so just want to give you a heads up. But after we sing our closing benediction, blessed be the tie that binds, that uh, Richard will join me here at the front, um, presented for membership at our church. And you can come by and, and uh, you all know him, but officially welcome him. So uh, we look forward to that. Uh, we have some birthdays this week. Uh, Oliver Derricks and Bill Lee, who is there at the back, a birthday on November 13th. Happy birthday, Bill. Yes. How, how many will that be? 85. Wow, congratulations. Wonderful. Also, um, Tim and Trudy O'Neill will celebrate an anniversary, and they are going down this week to Kentucky to be with Sean and um, his, his wife, uh, who are both in the uh, military, uh, in the Navy, and they will be deployed um, in just two or three weeks. And so they want to spend time together as a family uh, in Kentucky where, um, where Sean and his wife are posted at present. And so uh, be in prayer for Tim and Trudy as they travel and they have this time together as family. So um, let's go ahead and sing happy birthday to all of these friends. Happy anniversary. Happy birthday to Worship and prayer. Oh Lord, you are so amazing and so great beyond our ability to even comprehend in small measure. And so, Lord, we offer you this time of worship. We ask that you will, 
Lord, bless it and anoint it with your Holy Spirit. We pray that you will open up our minds and hearts as we sing. And Lord, as we um, uh, pray and as we hear your word preached, as we have communion together, oh Lord, we give all these things to you knowing it is you who gives life and meaning to all of this. Oh, Lord, thank you for this day you've made and for the gift of life that you have given to each of us. This is our prayer in your holy, precious name. Amen. We begin today with our opening anthem for the beauty of the earth and I invite you to stand or remain seated as you wish as we sing together change, and that is, rather than have a responsive reading, I wanted to hear from you any prayer requests, uh, any updates to our uh, prayer list, and also praise. And so uh, if you know of um, an update, uh, then invite you to share that at this time. For one, um, Many of you know that Lynn Shaddle has not been well this week, and she's been to the hospital uh, two or three times, and she has an infection, uh, and so they've been treating her for that. It has been quite uh, painful and um, disorienting, and so if we can pray for Lynn, uh, she uh, really, really appreciates that. I know that Carol Lear also is out today with shingles um, and uh, is not not doing well. And someone else has shingles. Oh, Sandra. Uh, Sandra, uh, Terry Jarvis's sister in Alabama, is suffering with um, with shingles, uh, quite painful. So, uh, other updates or praises, prayer requests. Okay. I just wanted to say thank you for all of your prayers uh, this past month with uh, Zach and I both having COVID. We really appreciate it. And um, everything, I had a checkup on Friday, and everything is looking really well for the baby. And 
So we are definitely on the mend, and I know that that is really thanks to you all for your thoughts and prayers and concerns and phone calls. I really appreciate it. Amen. I think the baby uh, is the due date December 30th still. Yeah. So I told Jen that she could have it the Monday after Christmas. That way she can be at choir practice on Wednesday. <laughs> yeah, and then be sure and be here on church uh, on, on New Year's Day. So we've got it planned. It's already covered. You know, no, no worries. Okay, Jan. Um, I'd just like to thank everybody for their prayers for my brother. Um, he had surgery on Tuesday and really came through fantastic. They shocked his heart once and it fell right into regular rhythm. And now he's got a loop recorder inserted to record any problems that he may have. So I appreciate everybody's prayers. Amen. Um, you might know that Susan Gritton uh, is still recovering from her um, heart shock procedure. And, um, and so she asked for our prayers. It's been a, kind of a slow process, but uh, she is gaining strength day by day. Any other prayer updates, prayer requests? All right, anything? Well, let us... Uh, be faithful in prayers uh, for all um, the ones we know of. Uh, Randy Bunton will have surgery this week in Iowa City, and he's, uh, it's a serious surgery. Um, and, uh, of course, uh, we're all concerned for Randy. He's been through quite an ordeal for a number of months. And so let's pray that this surgery go smoothly and that um, that he begins his healing process after that and um, just lift up Randy and Glenda and the entire family in your prayers. Also, um, our friends Beta and David Evangelista who are Filipino uh, ministers in Manila, they finally came home from uh, an isolation ward and they are uh, they're doing better, but she cannot go back to work uh, for another five weeks. And so she's trying to um, do a catering business from home in order to make money. Um, and so uh, the Philippines doesn't have the same kind of uh, benefits for jobs as we do. So if you don't work, you don't get paid. Uh, the government doesn't help, the business doesn't help, and she works for a major food manufacturer, and so she's the main breadwinner, and David is a pastor. So let's pray for David and, and Beta Evangelista as well. Uh, join me now as we pray together. Oh Lord, we thank you that indeed you are the God who hears our prayers and is moved when we hurt and when we're suffering and when we're concerned for our friends and loved ones and people we don't even know. So we do pray for those who are suffering today and ask for your mercy upon them. Lord, we pray uh, that um, you would pour out healing power, courage, encouragement, Lord, that you will be near those who are holding on to you like David and Beta Evangelista, that you'll provide for them uh, their every need in, uh, in many different ways. Lord, we just pray for them. And Lord, we just thank you that um, we have you as our Abba, Father, and that you... Um, care for us and we can cast all our cares on you because you do care for us thank you for the answers to prayer we've seen for your presence in our lives we give you thanks and praise and make our prayer in the powerful name of jesus christ our lord and savior amen
Let's continue to worship as we sing together, Faithful One, one of the beautiful choruses that we have learned this year. I invite you to join me as we sing. Feel free to stay seated or stand as we sing, Faithful One. Oh, yeah. 
from whom all blessings flow and in response to that we gladly give part of what he's given us to him and his work seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you so now let us bless these offerings and gifts that we bring to the Lord oh God you are the one from whom all blessings flow, the giver of every good and perfect gift. And so now we ask your blessings on these gifts. And Lord, may you use them and multiply them that your name will be exalted in all the earth. O oh Lord, bless these gifts and bless each giver. And use these gifts that lives would be touched and transformed. This is our prayer in your holy, precious name. Amen. We give thanks to the one from whom all blessings flow. Singing out our doxology of praise, I invite you to uh, join me as we sing the doxology. And uh, feel free once again to stand or be seated 
as we sing. Let's stand and sing or be seated as you wish as we sing. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy told us Wednesday night she wasn't sure how much longer she'd be able to play the doxology on the organ since you have to see the pedals <laughs> but she does a pretty great job yes and today for special music we have an old uh, favorite hymn all about coming together and worshiping brethren we have met to worship today David Luzatter and uh, Deb Miller will come and lead us in this beautiful song. Brethren, we have met to worship.
Thank you, David and Deb. Please pray for me as I preach the word. We are in our series uh, on live wires, and um, God created us to be uh, human beings that are alive with his life and with his power, uh, to be live wires filled with his uh, presence and uh, living in a trusting relationship with him. And so, really, much of life is about learning how to live in this trusting relationship with God. And so, really, on one hand, uh, we have that option to trust God uh, in the days of our life. And on the other side, we have the temptation to take things into our own hands and try to um, work it out uh, in our own way. And so if you want to know the story of the Bible, it is really about a series of tests between those options, trusting God or taking things into our own hands. In In the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve were told, Take anything you want. You can eat from any tree, just don't eat from that one. And it was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God knew they needed wisdom, the knowledge of good and evil to live, but he was saying, trust me, and in my time, then you will have that. Did they do that? No. They took. And with that faith, faithful and fatal decision, uh, we have uh, the rest of human history. And so God, from that time, has been trying to put this relationship back together. And so, just a quick uh, summary of what this um, series is about and what we've said to this point Uh, First of all, we began with Adam and Eve in the garden saying that we, as human beings, have been created in God's image. No other creature can say that. No other creature is that. What does that mean? It means that, for one thing, we are male and female, and in those expressions, together we express... uh, the, the wholeness of God. But then, going further, uh, we are to be fruitful and multiply, to fill the earth and subdue it. Or in other words, order it. Uh, when you take care of a garden, what do you have to do? You have to do some work in order to make it fruitful. And so, Uh, This was part of our calling and identity. And it says in 128 of Genesis, Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. We were made to work and to take care of creation. But we forfeited that when we made that terrible choice. And then, the next week we looked at the call of Abram and his story. So, God, he decides to choose uh, a person from whom he's going to build a family. And so, he um, comes to Abram and he says these uh, famous words from Genesis chapter 12. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Okay, so God is going to use Abram and his family. And who is Abram's family? Yeah, it's Israel. It's the people of Israel. 
And then we are part of that family as an extension of that. We've been grafted on to that tree. And so God chooses one person and he is going to build a family to bless the entire earth. And so we know that um, Abram wasn't perfect. Uh, He took things into his own hands. Um, They tried to have a child, a crazy idea, but they uh, took Sarah's uh, servant, Hagar, and Sarah said, well, just have a child through her. We're not getting anywhere the other way. So, um, And so Hagar becomes pregnant, and then there's this jealousy, despising going on between Sarah and Hagar. Hagar has to flee into the desert pregnant. God appears to Hagar and uh, rescues her. And uh, there's, there's a number of other things where what's happening? Abram is trying to take control. He's trying to take things into his own hands. I mean, how are you going to have a great nation if you don't even have a single child? So God is asking him to trust him for a child and... Isaac is born, but then God asks the seemingly impossible where he says, Take Isaac, go up the mountain of Moriah, and sacrifice him. And so as he's about to plunge that knife, God stops him and provides a ram. And that that mountain, where is it? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. And that is the place where sacrifices were to take place in the temple uh, centuries later. That's the place where Melchizedek appeared to him and blessed him with all sorts of uh, provisions after a battle. Um, And so we've got that story of Abraham. Now, today, we come to the story of Moses and Aaron. Now... Abraham's family does grow, and they um, are rescued from famine uh, through Joseph in Egypt, and they make their way to settle in Egypt, and they multiply. Then there comes a Pharaoh who doesn't know Joseph, and the Israelite people are enslaved. They're forced to make bricks to build the great cities of Egypt. And so God calls Moses to rescue them, to lead these slaves out of Egypt to the promised land. And so, um, basically, uh, that is quite an interesting story. Um, And... So he calls out uh, the Israelites. He delivers them through the waters. And um, he tells them in Exodus chapter 19 uh, these words. Let me start with Exodus 19.3 if you'd like to turn in your Bible. Exodus 19.3. Then Moses went up to God and the Lord called him to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did in Egypt and how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now if you obey me and fully keep my covenant, so this kind of special relationship like a marriage partnership between God and his people, Then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. Wow. So, Moses is supposed to tell the people, you're all going to be priests. Lucky you. How many of you dreamed of being a priest when you were a kid? How many of you just dreamed of, oh, when I grow up, I want to be a priest? 
Or I want to be a kingdom of priests. I want to be part of, a, part of a whole nation of priests. Well, that's what God plans to do. He plans to make a nation that is going to be his connection between himself and the world. See, a priest is a connector. It connects God with people. And so he had intended for the nation of Israel to be blessed and then to be a blessing to the rest of the world, to all the nations. And so what do the people say? All right. So Moses went back and summoned the elders of the people and set before them all the words the Lord had commanded him to speak. The people all responded together. We will do everything the Lord has said so Moses brought their answer back to the Lord. So they say, sure, we'll be your people and we'll do everything you say. Did that happen? Not quite. Not quite. So God prepares for the people to come up the mountain. And go, they go through this preparation time. But then we come to uh, Exodus chapter 19, verse 16. On the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp trembled. So, just imagine being at the foot of Mount Sinai and you have been warned that if you touch the mountain, you'll die, okay? That if an animal touches the mountain, they'll die. And then there's all this cloud and fire and thunder and a trumpet blast. Would you be excited to go up that mountain? I don't think so. And these people were basically freaking out they were scared so anyway we have a situation where the people are afraid to come close to God and I think that's a situation many people find themselves in um, they, they want to go to heaven when they die but they're not so sure about being close to God uh, a lot of people don't like God. Uh, they have a misconception of Him, and they're not so sure about being close to Him. Well, as I've said before, the main thing about heaven, the, uh, the most dominant aspect is the presence of God. So if you don't want to be around God, then you might want to think about going to heaven because that's what it is. It is being with God. So people who think that they're going to go to heaven and have a little you know, space over here and, and hope that God doesn't come by very often, it's not going to work like that. You are going to be in the immediate, constant presence of God who is, who is pure love. And so... Um, if that's where we're going, we better get used to that now. We better get used to that now. That means we learn to trust God now. We learn to walk with God through this life now. And so that is uh, where we are and where we are going. So God proceeds to give uh, the first of his commandments, the Ten Commandments, and um, the very uh, first one is, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. And then the second one, you shall not make for yourself an image in any form in any, of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. Okay, so... Don't make an image of anything. Don't make an idol. Why? Because you are 
my representatives here on earth. You, human beings, are the image of God meant to represent me to the rest of creation. And so he gives that and the rest of the Ten Commandments. Well, the people continue to be scared out of their wits. It says in verse 18 of chapter 20, When the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain in smoke, they trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance and said to Moses, Speak to us yourself and we will listen. But do not have God speak to us or we will die. And so, Moses, we can handle you. But we can't handle God. Uh, so they, they're um, avoiding God and this relationship with him. So Moses goes up and he's on the mountain. And he's there for a day. He's there for a week, two weeks, three weeks. Four weeks, it's getting to be 40 days. And the people down the mountain, they're starting to wonder, well, is this guy ever going to come back down? And here we are in the middle of the desert. Uh, they lived in Egypt for 400 years, so they're not used to this. And so they start grumbling and complaining. And they finally compel... Aaron, who is supposed to be the high priest who leads the people in the right way, they convince him to make an idol, an image. And um, then Moses gets wind of it, and uh, Joshua, who is kind of halfway up the mountain, and anyway... Um, this sad story unfolds. Aaron answered them, Take off your gold earrings that your wives, your sons, and your daughters are wearing and bring them to me. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. He took what they handed him and made it into an idol, cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. Then they said, These are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf and announced, Tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord, to Yahweh. So they think that this calf is the representation of Yahweh. And they have broken the very first commandments of worshiping other gods and making graven images. And so... Uh, they do have a party, and um, it's not a pretty sight. And word of this uh, idolatry reaches Moses and, um, and Joshua. And, um, and so finally Moses comes down and he says to Aaron in verse 21 of chapter 32, what did these people do to you that you led them into such great sin? Don't be angry, my Lord, Aaron answered. You know how prone these people are to evil. They said to me, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us out of, up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. So I told them, whoever has any gold jewelry, take it off. Then they gave me the gold, and I threw it into the fire, and out came this calf. That makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? I mean, what a story. They just gave me the gold, I threw it in the fire, and out popped the calf, you know? And so Aaron is failing utterly at his job, and... Uh, he is leading the people to break the very first commandments. And then Moses goes to the Lord 
and he intercedes and pleads on behalf of um, the people. And he says to the Lord, verse 31, O Moses went back to the Lord and said, O what a great sin these people have committed. They have made themselves gods of gold. But now please forgive their sin. But if not, then blot me out of the book you have written. So Moses is willing to even give his own life that the people would be spared. And so we see a foreshadowing of the kind of sacrifice and the type of love that is needed in order to rescue God's people. And so, anyway, the Lord does relent and um, he spares the people and... um, And so, um, the story continues. Now, Moses comes down from the mountain. He's shining with the glory of the Lord. And um, and so, um, it is a story which is utterly, utterly incredible to me. Um, And it goes on and on with the priesthood failing again and again. For example, when they finally build the tabernacle and they're doing their first sacrifices in the tabernacle, Aaron's sons, they blow it. And it goes like this. Uh, This is Leviticus chapter 10. Starting with verse 1, Aaron's sons Nadab and Abihu took their censers, put fire in them, and added incense. And they offered unauthorized fire before the Lord. I don't know what that is exactly, but it's not good. Unauthorized fire before the Lord, contrary to his command. So fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Moses then said to Aaron, This is what the Lord spoke of when he said, Among those who approach me, I will be proved holy. In the sight of all the people, I will be honored. Aaron remained silent. So, you've got two priests, two sons of Aaron, that are struck dead within the tabernacle. And... um, And they have to be taken out because they're defiling the tabernacle. And so, um, who goes in to get them? Well, Moses summoned Mishael and Elzaphan, sons of Aaron's uncle Uziel, and said to them, Come here, carry your cousins outside the camp, away from the sanctuary. So they came and carried them, still in their tunics, outside the camp as Moses ordered uh, that I can I can imagine that was a pretty tough assignment for Mishael and uh, Elsaphan, uh, having to go in and retrieve uh, their cousins. So, wow, the whole story of Israel's priesthood from Aaron to his sons to Eli is almost like Keystone Cops. They're supposed to do one thing and they do another. And what it illustrates is that even when we are supposed to fulfill a high calling of being connected with God and being a connector with people for God, we fail. We blow it. And the Levitical priesthood... Aaron, his sons, so on, they illustrate that uh, we simply find it very hard to follow God's instructions. Uh, Eli's sons, um, they 
experienced basically the same thing. And so um, it is a story of, um, of failure. So we need a different kind of priest, one who is more like Moses, one who will intercede for others and offer his life for their failures. And who will it be? Israel makes it to the promised land finally. And next week we will look at the story of King David and how God is establishing another line of priesthood and royal, another royal line through David. So what does this mean to us? Well, as I've reflected on the story throughout the week, it seems clear to me that we, as we are, in and of ourselves, we are not live wires. We are not ones filled with the power and love of God living in trusting relationship to Him. Uh, we are more like short-circuited. <laughs> you know, we don't, we don't make the connection. And um, we're no good at this process of trusting God and waiting on Him and being attentive to Him, and we again and again go our own way, doing it our own way, taking things into our own hands. It reminds me of the story um, of the uh, class uh, from, I think it was Taiwan, who came for a visit to New York City, and it was her first visit. And they didn't know uh, English very well, but they were going to learn in about two weeks' time, a two-week visit, about the United States. And so they had lessons in Western culture and um, how things work here and Western values, etc., and then uh, one afternoon, this class said, we're going to let you go out into the neighborhood around here, and um, we're going to give you each a cell phone, and just stay right here, don't go any further, but if you, if you need to, then just call the number that's in the phone, and we'll help you out. Well, they went out for the afternoon, and um, time came for them to come back. All of them came back except one, and they waited. They waited half hour, then it was an hour, hour and a half. And finally the phone rang, and it was this lost uh, Taiwanese uh, young man, and he said, lost, lost. And they said, okay, don't worry, we can find you. Just um, go to the corner, look up. And there'll be names of the streets, you know, the street and the cross street. And you just tell us where you are. So he walked to the corner, and he looked up, and he says, I'm at the corner of walk and don't walk. <laughs> <laughs> and isn't that where we find ourselves many times? We're at the corner of walk and don't walk. I mean, we want to trust the Lord, but then we're tempted to take things into our own hands. Uh, we, we want to trust and believe that God is for us, and He's going to see us through, and He's going to make a way where there seems to be no way. But then we're rattled as well. We're at the corner of walk and don't walk. And so God is in this process of restoring us in our relationship to Him to a relationship where we walk in trusting dependence on Him. But it's going to come a different way through a different line. And that will lead us to the story of King David. Pray with me. Oh Lord... 
now as we consider your story from the Bible that describes your covenant relationship and rescue of your people, we realize that it's our story and that we need you. We need you too. And so, Lord, we come to the Lord's Supper realizing that this is what we need, a living dependence upon you, knowing that you came to be for us what we could never be ourselves, and to give your life on our behalf. Oh, Lord, we thank you. And in this simple meal, the bread and the cup, we reaffirm our love and commitment to you. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. If you'll take your cup and... You can peel back that first piece of plastic so you, you can see the wafer. Scripture says, as Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had broke it, he said, this is my body for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Lord, as we prepare to eat this, this bread, we remember your sacrifice for us upon a cross. No one put you there. You willingly went, giving your life for us so that we might be restored to life. So, Lord... Taking this bread, we recommit ourselves to you and express once more our love for you and give thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. The body of Christ, take and eat. And then scripture says that after supper he took the cup. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. The blood of the new covenant. And as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you are proclaiming my death until I come again. O oh Lord, as we take this cup, and we tell this story by taking this bread and taking this cup. We remember and we proclaim that it is only through your life and our trust in you that we have eternal life. Lord, thank you. Thank you for such great love. Such amazing grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The blood of Christ, take three. The amazing thing about God's sacrifice for us is that it not only was offered to us as individuals, but it was offered so that God's family that he began in the garden might once again come together and be united together. Blessed be the tie that binds. And so the message of the cross is a message for all nations, for all peoples. And so... Followers of Jesus more than anyone should be ones who reach out 
and take the hand of those uh, from all over the world. Uh, we are um, one family in Christ. And so, uh, Richard, uh, I mentioned at the first that we were welcoming Richard today um, into the fellowship of our church. Would you come up here with me at this time? And we are so glad that you have come to our church, and we are so grateful for the one through whom you've come, uh, Mary, your lovely wife, and all that she has meant to our church through so many years. And uh, it's been a pleasure getting to know you over the past year, and Richard has been uh, a weekly participant in our, our Tuesday night Bible study, and we've done some orientation to the church together. And so he is um, very well prepared and, and certain of this decision. He comes on statement of faith uh, in his uh, trust in Christ. And so, uh, Richard, it is our pleasure to welcome you into the fellowship of our church. And all who affirm this decision Richard has made, will you join me in saying amen? Amen. 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 And so that is the affirmation. And Richard would like to share a few words. Do you have a mic? Okay. We want to hear these words. Okay. Okay, right. take it away. I'll hold it close. I'm so pleased to be presented for membership to First Baptist Church of Moli. After not having God in my life for a very long time, I have been blessed that through the message of the church's fellowship and to get my, and to get my renewed faith in God and accepted my eternal salvation through Jesus Christ, I am so blessed that I have someone in my life to show me the way back to God. Amen. Amen. That is, uh, that is so beautiful, isn't it? No, that's for me. Yes, yes. And um, that's also a testimony to us all that uh, the difference that we can make. We're talking about being a connector being connections between heaven and earth, between God and other people. And Mary was that for Richard. And, and every one of us can be that for someone else, reaching out as a friend, as, as a neighbor. And uh, I don't need to tell you how many people surround us each day who are utterly, utterly lost and are seeking meaning. They, they don't know that there is a God who loves them with such passionate love that he would die for them. Uh, they need to know. They need to know. Let's stand now as we sing our song of fellowship. And I invite you to just stand we're still in our kind of protocol of just standing and not linking, but uh, we are one in Christ. So let us sing together. Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love. Blessed be the tie that binds. Would you come up here and stand at the front? And I invite you to come by and just give an official welcome to Richard and to the fellowship of our church. Uh, this uh, very important step he's made. So if you just stand right here. 
All right. I invite you to come forward and extend the right hand to fellowship.